<laughs> so my name is Lin Tufanui. I'm uh, uh, currently uh, the referent of a community of experts in Orange on uh, networks of the future. We are around 70 people um, selected over the entire group, not only research. And I'm working with other referents from seven of our communities on security, uh, environment, uh, data, uh, uh, home and content, transaction communication and services, etc. So if you need an expert from Orange and you think that there is also a value for our company, you can, you can contact me. Uh, I'm also a research project manager on uh, backscattering technologies. So I work on ambient backscattering and also reconfigurable intelligence surfaces. And since uh, November last year, I'm the first uh, Orange Fellow and there will be more <laughs> in the next years. So I would like to thanks first uh, for Marco, to Marco to, to invite me to this event and, uh, and allow me to share our vision on, on this uh, technology, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces on which we've been working together at least since 2017, or I can't, I can't recall, or even before. Um, so uh, I guess you know what is a risk. You've been discussing that uh, for a day. So just recalling how we see it in orange, we use actually the same, the, the initial definition uh, so I'm recalling this paper uh, that was uh, edited, led by, by Marco. So uh, the idea is that uh, th this risk, we see it as a one uh, element of the environment. One uh, element of the environment, uh, a scatterer that uh, we can control to add uh, artificial propagation path to the environment that we can control to uh, improve. Uh, the link budget between our transmitter and the receiver. This is the, the first use case, but we'll see later, later that there are other use cases. And the advantage we saw uh, uh, at the beginning uh, was that this uh, new uh, equipment is uh, low, should be, we hope, uh, low power because it doesn't uh, actively radiate. It uh, passively uh, reflects things like a, a mirror. So this is it for the introduction. So we've been uh, working intensively on the subject uh, since 2021 with uh, our partners. Many uh, of them are in the room in the Rice CG project led by uh, Emilio <laughs> uh, at CA. And we've, uh, you have the list of partners here. It's a nice combination of academic labs and industrial uh, partners. And especially among uh, industrial partners, you can find network manufacturers, operators, and verticals. SNCF, the train station uh, operator, and, and Fiat, uh, the car manufacturer. So uh, as an operator, we learned a lot during this uh, free year project on use cases, architecture and control signaling, expected performance, experiments and prototype, and we pop up uh, into uh, hard problems, which are spectrum uh, coexistence challenge and deployment and planning challenge. And I want to share this with you today. Uh, so use cases. When we start to work on this on during, in 2021, uh, we identified three uh, family of UK use cases you can see here. Uh, enhanced connectivity and reliability, enhanced localization and sensing, and enhanced sustainability and security. So um, the idea is that uh, you, a base station has to serve a, a customer. And uh, what if we could help the propagation, the link budget, boost the link budget thanks to this risk by adding uh, coherently uh, some signals, uh, reflecting signals, and uh, uh, improve the propagation. We can also uh, try to avoid uh, users. It's not on this figure here. 
but to uh, avoid uh, exposing people. I, I'll come back uh, later on that. We can also uh, use RIS uh, to um, enable or boost localization with a few network nodes. I will show an example of localization using only one base station. And uh, uh, also, uh, it is not on this figure, we'll see it later, we can improve uh, security. So this was um, in 2021. Let me remind you the context, 2021, operators were deploying 5G. The 5G dream was still, uh, we were still uh, in the 5G dream. Uh, today, uh, three years later, it's, uh, the, the dream is over. So um, the dream is over. If you remember, 5G was uh, built uh, for free purposes. Enhanced mo mobile broadband uh, data services, uh, massive IoT, and um, ultra uh, reliable, reliable and low latency communications, uh, factory, etc. Where are we today? Uh, last year, uh, the uh, European Telecommunication Network Operator Association uh, issued at the European Commission, a, a call for a legislation for fair share. Why? Because we've been investing huge amount of money into deploying 5G networks. It's it's really a burden. And who who is making money today? It's large traffic generators. You know them. So it's uh, uh, YouTube, Google, uh, etc. And more recently, to our surprise. Uh, uh, app provider with very, very small content like TikTok. Uh, it's flooding our uh, network and we have to, uh, uh, we have to uh, change our infrastructure to, to take, uh, to convey this, uh, this traffic. But the, the mobile plans don't, uh, the, the prices of the mobile plans don't increase. We offer 5G to our customer with the same prices. And I would say for smartphones uh, industry, it's kind of the same thing. They are not making so much money about with 5G. So there is a, a big lesson to learn about uh, how you design a future generation. We, uh, we felt uh, to uh, find uh, business value in 5G today and uh, there is another uh, aspect so so this is economical i'm talking about economical sustainability making new generations that allow companies to grow or at least to sustain economically the second aspect uh, uh, still with uh, regarding 5g is uh, the environmental sustainability it is true that 5G was the first generation that took into account uh, energy efficiency from the start compared to 4G. Uh, that is uh, more energy efficient thanks to advanced uh, deep sleep modes, um, uh, beam forming, etc. It is true. But when uh, you deploy this uh, new network, you have a huge cardboard footprint, carbon footprint at the initial deployment. And during the first years, you have low traffic. And we all know that the network, when the network is on and there is low traffic, uh, you have still a huge amount of energy that is spent because today networks are not at the stage where you have zero load, zero energy consumption. So second problem. And last problem I want to uh, come uh, back on regarding 5G is um, societal uh, sustainability. It's true that uh, 5G had the, the ambition to provide ubiquitous coverage everywhere in every countries, especially countries uh, in, in development. But have you seen uh, loons in Africa, right? These, uh, this was one of the solutions. 
The problem is that uh, these solutions were too costly for operators who wanted to, to try to deploy it commercially. So what is the lesson learned of 5G? If you don't take into account the three pillars, economical sustainability, environmental sustainability, societal sustainability, you may, you may uh, run into troubles. So today in 2024, we do not research, we don't do research on future networks uh, as we did uh, 10 years ago. So in XIX2 project, the flagship European project, uh, the follow-up of XIX1 that started uh, last year, and that is gathering uh, 47 uh, labs. Uh, many of them are represented here today. Uh, 47 labs from academic and academia and industry, and that is also involving um, researchers in social science, not only in tech. Uh, we try to design a peak Z that meets um, these three targets, sustainab economical sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability, and societal sustainability. So let's go back to our subject today. It's risk. Risk. We started risk research in the five. We still the five G dream in mind. Are we still comp are, are we compliant today with this uh, these new uh, requirements? My personal opinion is that kind of kind of. If you look at uh, environmental sustainability. It should be okay at two conditions. If the risk is at the end one or uh, one order of magnitude lower in power consumption than an active device, not twice lower, one order of magnitude uh, lower. I will show you some evidences that it seems possible to based on our. Uh, uh, um, collaborations with partners. And the second point, and I have, the problem is I, I have not seen so many evidences that it is feasible today. It's a low carbon footprint design of such equipment. It is to say not, not generating a huge carbon footprint by, this new, uh, by uh, uh, producing these new equipment. So shelter sustainability, it's something that is, um, this is the aspect which uh, creates the most uh, debates in, in research today. My personal guess is at least this equipment is not radiating waves, so it should be uh, easy, m m easier to uh, have it accepted or adopted by the society. I have no no uh, clue regarding this aspect. Economical sustainability, uh, we think as an operator that it will be economically sustainability at two conditions. It has to be deployed only where needed. So the concept of boosted areas, I'm going to come back to this concept a lot during this talk. This is not something that you are going to deploy as a layer everywhere. You are going to uh, ruin yourself, right? You have to deploy it exactly where needed, where it has value, where you can earn money of it, and where you can make extra money of it. I'm recalling you the problem of the fair share. We are deploying 5G, and the OTTs are making money of it, OK? Second thing, it has to be order of magnitude cheaper than active repeaters. Okay. Something that is uh, not written here, but it's the elephant in the room is the spectrum. We'll come back later on that. The spectrum that is best fitted for this technology today has no business driver millimeter waves. I'll come back to that. Today, it is the case. OK. So uh, during uh, these three years, one of uh, my personal obsession 
was to understand what was the impact of this new device and node on the architecture and control signaling in mobile networks. So we've worked uh, quite hard with uh, many people in this room from the rice 6G project, especially Vincenzo from uh, NEC. And so the approach we have taken at the beginning, we were not converging, it was very complex. Too many possible solutions. So how do you uh, deal with such kind of uh, technologies? We uh, followed a bottom-up approach. We looked at all the risk-aided schemes proposed by all partners. So in total, we have like 45 or 40 different schemes proposed by partners for the three types of use case families. Remember, boosting connectivity and reliability. Uh, localization and sensing, and the last one, sustainability and security. So what you see here in these tables, each column in was is one scheme. Okay, each column is one scheme, and each line is an interface between nodes, with UE space station that you need to use for control signaling to get your scheme working. If you suppress one of these arrow, the scheme is just not working. So it's a requirement. And on the figure here, you have the synthesis of what is needed to support all schemes. You have it for the free use case uh, family. And one thing that is appearing very clearly, some node is very, very frequently involved in this control signaling, it's the base station. Why? Because most teams propose to tightly optimize the way the base station transmits and receives and the way the, the propagation environment is tuned. And it's obvious, right? You are not going to, to tune the environment without knowing how the base station and the UA are going to use it, right? So it makes sense. So the base station have a key role, but I have to be honest, there were a lot of operators in the, this project, so it's really network centric. I have to be uh, honest, there are some other companies like Apple who have different views where the base station is completely out of the loop of the control. So to be honest, I have to report that to you. Of course, we are completely, completely against that. We don't want uh, the smartphones to manipulate the propagation uh, environment that we are using as operators. So it's a minority. I mean, it's Apple alone. Uh, what else can I do? say? Yeah, there is one. Uh, sometimes one node is appearing, which is um, a risk orchestrator that is, uh, I think, can we see it? Not here. That is um, coordinating several uh, risks. Okay. Now, uh, these are the interface and the control signaling. Now I want to uh, talk about, uh, to go uh, deeper down in, in the control, how it works. We realized uh, when sharing our uh, schemes and the way they, they uh, work, that actually control is everywhere in the network, the nodes and uh, the, the devices. You have not to think about control nodes or control devices. Like I, I, I hear a lot about risk controller, right? No, no, no. It's real risk control functions. Risk control functions are split over several nodes in the network and several devices. It's control functions and protocol control protocols, and you have many different solutions in the literature. So at least based on what we the ones we I know from the the Rice G project, there are kind of three families of uh, split of control functions. You can have um, 
a totally controlled risk. Um, it's not autonomous. It doesn't know how to tune itself. It is controlled by something external, something with that has a strong supervision. Okay, I'm not telling you now where this thing is physically located yet. We'll come back later on that. Second category, which is the most frequent one, control functions are split between the risk device and somewhere else. Okay. So this risk is partially autonomous. It can tune itself in part with some information it acquires by itself, plus some signaling coming from other parts of the network. And there is also, it's more rare, but it does exist, it does exist, a totally autonomous risk. It, ha, it, ha, it needs no supervision from anyone. It decides by itself, it does exist. So when you hear about risk controller equipment, it is just one example, one subset where you have supervision inside a special device, which is a risk controller. But in reality, supervision can be in several uh, type of nodes. Let's have a look at uh, an example here. Here is a totally controlled risk, an example of totally controlled risk. So it has, of course, a surface with some uh, functions, reflections, refractions, absorption, backscattering. I guess yesterday you had plenty of examples, right? Uh, it can use, from the physical view uh, point of view, pin diodes, varactors, whatever. I, I guess yesterday you had also plenty of examples. And this is this, there is this risk actuation function uh, concept that was introduced by, by Vincenzo and his NEC. Uh, it's physically, it can be a microcontroller, the thing that is going to set the unit cells uh, state. And here we are going to look at control functions. The minimum. Uh, this dumb, the dumbest wrist needs at least to receive control signaling. This is the minimum. Okay? And the, something that is never mentioned in the literature, but is clearly here, the elephant in the room, it's an RF modem that is listening to control signaling. If you control a wrist, it has to listen to control signaling over the air, in band, out of band, or it's a cable, but it's not realistic. It's not realistic to put a cable between the base station and the wrist. Okay, so it's over the air probably. So you have some over the air uh, inbound layer one and two control signaling. For example, switch to configuration. Blah, blah. And then you can use all uh, compression technique for uh, for uh, setting uh, the 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 risk uh, configuration code books, whatever. And at the, um, here is an example where all control functions are located at the base station. I'm not saying that it is the only architecture. It's an example that often pop up in, 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 uh, in the literature. So what is doing the base station? It's transmitting, receiving control signaling uh, from to the wrist. It's sending pilots for base station to wrist to UE channel. I'm not saying that the wrist is listening to pilots, no. But the, the UE is listening to pilots uh, transmitted by the base station, reflected by the wrist in a known state. Okay, so the UE can sense the channel for different states of the wrist because everything is coordinated. The UE and the wrist know, okay, now I'm testing codebook uh, be reflected beam number N. There is some control. 
and uh, etc. And the base station is computing uh, the joint transmit and reflecting beam forming weights or selecting uh, configurations in the transmit beam forming codebook and the risk codebook, uh, etc. And then it sends an order. It says to the risk, be ready. I'm, I'm good. I want uh, configuration number uh, K. Okay. The uh, other examples that I see often is a partially controlled risk, and this risk is much smarter. It's not only listening to control signals and obeying, it is measuring, it is sensing, and this has an impact on the uh, hardware. It means uh, that you are able to um, uh, you have some kind of uh, behind the antennas, you have two paths. One for switching, for reflection, uh, tunable reflection, and one for listening, okay? So this kind of uh, device is more complex and it's able to sense and to compute, compute uh, reflecting beforming weights and to apply them, but still it has to obey the base station, okay? Because otherwise the base station is not able to make joint transmit receive informing with the risk. Second example, so light supervision and high autonomy at the risk. Last thing I want to uh, highlight is that in most of these schemes, 40 or 40 schemes, uh, because they have been made by a generation of engineers that have been uh, uh, working on a closed loop, a fast control loop, link adaptation, adaptive beamforming, etc., is that in most cases, everything has to be super fast. Super fast between uh, channel sensing, uh, scheduling uh, beamforming weight computation, and application of beamforming transmit and, re and reflected beamforming. So we've done this kind of work that is, we looked at all the messages that had to be exchanged between nodes and, and devices. And we looked at the duration and how long it had to be done. And in most teams, it has to be done within the channel coherence time. That is, that means that in most cases, it's for pedestrian or fixed uh, mobilities of the UE. So lessons learned after three years working with all these partners. I know RACG is not representative of the whole the research in the whole world on risk, but it's, I think it's a good sample of, of the whole uh, research at the global level. And what we learned is that in the end, what, what seems the most popular uh, architecture is a, a base station transmitting uh, to uh, data and control signaling to UE. And this link is under the influence, and I'll come back later on this concept of influence, of risk, one or several risks. And these risks, they are passive regarding data. You see, they are not transmitting data. Okay, it's an influence. It's not a transmission, but they do actively transmit and receive control signaling. Okay. So the open question today is that, is such a risk still low power on chip? So we are working on that, uh, not with academia, academia, but directly with network manufacturers producing risk prototypes because they are building these prototypes and they can give us numbers and expected numbers regarding the, the cost and the energy consumption. And it seems that it depends a lot on the number of uh, devices that can be produced. Okay, so expected performance. This part, uh, so uh, before I, I show some numbers, I would like to, to discuss about coverage. So when we deploy a, a network, we uh, plot coverage. It's a metric, a performance metric. We have a service, a performance metric as a 
uh, as a function of the distance between the device and the base station. And usually we have a minimum target performance. And this defines your, your coverage, okay? When you add a risk in the propagation, you change the coverage. You can degrade it if you do dumb things, but you can also improve it, right? You improve the quality of service metric. So we can see two kinds of areas. Here, we already were in, inside the coverage and we are boosting the coverage. We are improving the quality of service. Here, we, are, we were out of coverage. We were below the target minimum and we are enabling the service. So there are always two kinds of AOI, area of influence. It's always, always boosting and enabling, okay? So here are very rapidly some examples. So I will detail this first example for a use case that we all uh, know very well, which is um, connection, real, uh, connection performance, data rate, spectral efficiency, and I will go very fast on the other use cases. Okay, so here um, the, the aim is to serve a mobile phone which is inside this building and served by this base station, uh, six, G, six gigahertz, uh, uh, sub six gigahertz, massive MIMO base station, 3.7 gigahertz, exactly. So a 5G base station. And this is um, the channel gain between the UE and the base station when you move the UE inside this building. And you can see a good channel gain in the front room, the one that is closest to the base station, and then it degrades, and then you are even out of coverage, blue, okay? When you add risk, you improve the link budget, okay? The, the propagation channel is, is more red, it's better. And you have a, a channel boosting of uh, NDB here. But as I told you, we don't care about channel boosting. What we care about is coverage. Are we above or below the target quality? Okay, so you have to define a target, a target quality of service and look at what the, the impact on the coverage. And there you can see uh, the, the two areas I was mentioning, the yellow enabled. So when we were out of coverage and thanks to risk, we have the minimum target quality of service to, to allow uplink voice call. This is a yellow and the green area, oh yeah, blue green area, it's boosted areas. And dark blue is unchanged. Even though you, bo you boost the channel, it's not enough to get the target quality of service. So it's, it's useless, okay? So we did the same kind of exercise for localization and sensing. For security and sustainability. So I'm going very fast on that. I let you uh, go to the details because I have not so much time if if you want to, but now I want to show you numbers. So we we went through to all our use cases, uh, all these schemes. So here is um, a selection of uh, a sub selection of 20 schemes that are focused on energy efficiency boosting, security boosting, and uh, EMF exposure avoidance. It is uh, to say uh, providing high data rate with low exposure to uh, non-intended users. So here we have tested that in downlink and uplink. So here the aim is to provide uh, data rate to downlink data to an intended user and to avoid exposing uh, someone else or to avoid uh, uh, eavesdropping. And in the uplink, it's to upload the data to the network uh, while with avoiding exposing its, uh, uh, the, the customer to its own wave, exposing other users or uh, helping eavesdroppers, okay? And if you look at the numbers, when it says uh, enable, it means that we had an infinite gain, that we had no service before and thanks to risk, we managed to get it. And you can see huge numbers, factor of two, factor of seven, more than four, 100, 
seven, seven, ten, etc. Be very careful. There is a problem today on the way uh, this technology is assessed by simulation. I've shown you the area of influences. Now, when you look at simulations, methodologies, they assess the performance on assessment areas. This is a red area. So imagine I focus my simulation only in, on this red area. I will have infinite gain. I will say risk is an enabler, but it's true only for this area. If I focus my simulation here, I have a strong average gain. But if I, I assess the system over all this area, then I have a very weak average gain. Okay. And the problem with statistical methods is to take into account this. Can you tell where are you assessing the technology compared to the area of influence? Can you tell it? Okay. It's not meaningful to assess it on this two small areas or two large areas. It makes no sense. So we believe it's an open question on how to assess this technology. Okay. The methods are here, but they are not, not perfectly uh, suited for the problems. So I have 10 minutes left. So prototypes and experiments. So uh, even though we are uh, mobile operators uh, like NTT Docomo, uh, we do we do some prototyping and testing because it's uh, in uh, our DNA. We have a big research center uh, and uh, lots of experts in antennas and electromagnetism, and uh, we like to uh, see things by ourselves and understand. Yeah put our hands on. So in 2021 with, with Marco, we tested our first uh, risk prototype, a small, tiny, modest one. It's more like a A4, A4 uh, or US letter size uh, risk. It's not a smart wall. Smart wall. And then uh, in 2022, a big one with 1,000 elements, which is closer to the one uh, that uh, the ones that are tested by the University of Surrey. I guess you saw these big, these big giants, really, they, they do. Um, so uh, what is particular with uh, this risk? It's that it is con con uh, continuously controllable. I guess yesterday you've been, you've seen a lot of quantized risk and maybe some uh, continuous uh, risk uh, based on, on a variator. So this is this, this type of risk. And as we kept in mind the environmental uh, requirement, we did uh, try to see what is it possible to build this device based on all ones. So we used old uh, array, uh, uh, reflect array antennas that were initially built for special communications. Actually, uh, this use case is coming back now. And uh, we uh, refurbished it into a risk and it worked because you have all the control functions to tune the varactor unit cells and you just need to take off uh, the feeder. So it means that, well, we are encouraging our network man manufacturer to think of that. What if, is it possible to use old antennas and try to avoid at the maximum extra carbon footprint when building risk. We are asking. Um, this is for uh, carbon footprint. The second thing is energy efficiency. So for this particular uh, prototype, based on our computation, we should it should be able uh, with the right design to achieve below what energy consumption because it's using femtoampere current and up to five volt per unit cell and with 1,000 unit cells, it's below what? Okay. And uh, so we tested that for two, uh, two use cases, um, boosting the, the coverage with low, low power consumption. So here is an example where uh, we artificially blocked 
uh, the communication between the transmitter and the receivers here. Okay. The, the, this is really, uh, it's not a real uh, coverage hole use case, it's artificial because we put, we have a pillar and then we use very directional antennas. We really do everything to block, to block the link between the transmitters and the receivers. And then we tune the risk to redirect uh, data, the energy from the transmitter to receiver one and two or receiver three. And uh, you can see here simulated reflected uh, beam patterns, okay? So uh, with quite strong, strong and directional reflected beams. And on the field, uh, these are the constellation received by receiver one, two, three. And this is a, the spectrum, the spectrum. And we can see a difference of 10 dB between the two, uh, the two uh, regions, 10 dB to 15 dB. So it does work. It does work. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this we wanted to check. It's possible to change the propagation environment by order of magnitude. The link budget. It does work. And the other thing we tested uh, recently is for security use cases. Is can we uh, null? Can we null uh, interference on an if dropper? or somebody we don't want to expose. So for me, I think it, it works, but the, it's not uh, yet uh, very clear to me uh, which kind of if dropper we can uh, apply this to because it should kind of participate. We should be able to have its location or channel. But if we had that, it works. You can, um, with this continuous director arrays, you can, to make two things. You can direct a beam towards the if dropper, and then you can tune the initial phase until it cancel the other propagation channel components. Okay, two effects: spatial and then phase shift. So it does work as well. And for me, the most uh, recent progress, the, the largest progress we've made uh, during the last years is, is this trial with greener wave uh, risk prototypes in, in, uh, in, um, in the train station. So here is uh, the, the risk greener wave prototype. I, I don't think it has been presented yesterday, maybe not. So very rapidly, it's a pin diode based reflected risk in the 5G millimeter wave band. And it's uh, it's A4 US letter size, um, thousands of elements, if I no, several hundred of elements, if I remember correctly. And what was interesting is that uh, in the train station, we had no uh, place to where to plug the wrist. You know, it's a real train station. You can tell uh, the guy from the train station, I want a plug for my experiment. No, no. no. <laughs> So uh, we use the risk with, uh, it was working on battery. It was powered on battery and it worked for three days on, on battery. So to, uh, that was a good sign that this technology can be low power. It's not yet low power enough. And I know Greener Weather is working on, on uh, below watt or order uh, watt, watt power consumption technology. But it was a good sign. And so this is the, the setup. We are not allowed to show photos of the train station because it's a public area. Um, so we we are allowed to show pictures of it. So you you believe us. So there is a store here and the wrist is here and the base station is here and it's 20, 20 30 meters away. And uh, there is a blocking, okay? It's millimeter wave, there is a blocking. And the aim, the goal is to uh, redirect uh, 5G uh, beams toward the, the, the smartphone. So it's a commercial uh, 5G base station and commercial smartphone. And the interesting thing in the, the experiment is that the base station and the smartphone are not even aware there is a risk. They are doing their uh, adaptive beam forming stuff with closed loop, closed loop adaptation, uh, CSI, uh, PMI stuff. 5G standard, they are not aware there is a risk in the environment. So how do we do? They use a greener way, they use geometrical approach. 
they use a laser pointer. They know where is the base station, they know where is the smartphone, and they pre-compute the risk tuning. And you can improve the tuning by uh, using a channel sounder to prepare the risk. And then we replace the channel sounder by the smartphone. So it's manual tuning, manual tuning to see the maximum gain we can obtain with this technology. So we are far from the control signaling loop that I have shown you in, at the beginning. We are, there is a gap between experiments and uh, schemes that are designed today by uh, engineers, okay? We are not yet there, but here we can uh, try to uh, assess what we could get uh, ideally. So there were two positions tested here behind ticket distributors and here behind the store. And we reached around 20 dB gain. So it does work. And A4, A4 stuff, a passive A4 stuff provides you 20 dB gain. This is not bad. And here, uh, I'm not sure you can see very clearly, but over time we change. We put the risk on, off, and then we see this 20 dB uh, gain. So lesson learned. It is true that this very passive, simple device brings a gain, 10 to 20 dB gain. We've seen it on the field. It is true that it works even without the commercial equipment knowing it. But this means that you do a lot of manual tuning yourself, not practically deployable as such. So the open questions are, we are waiting as operator for future prototypes to be tuned by the base station and the UE, like in the beginning of my talk. So we are asking when and discussing with uh, our partners. And we are waiting still for uh, the prototype that will really consume what or below what. Uh, uh, so 10 times lower than a typical uh, Wi-Fi router. There are, there are uh, evidences that it's feasible, but we have not seen yet uh, such a device. And regarding the cost, we are also working with manufacturers to understand uh, the cost, which seems to depend on the number, also on the number of devices that will be deployed. So last, oh, sorry, I'm late. So last but not least, very fast. So uh, we've been uh, working a lot in standardization and with RIS, a RISE 6G project on, on a problem. So when you illuminate a unit cell with a, 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 a pure carrier frequency, incident carrier frequency, and you change the carrier frequency, you see some reflections over large bandwidth. And typically, we have tested, uh, we have studied uh, four different risks. Uh, pin diode risk, barrector risk, RF uh, switch risk, uh, etc., and seen that uh, you have up to 40% uh, of the carrier frequency as a bandwidth of influence. That means that if you are working at, uh, uh, for instance, 5.2 gigahertz, uh, you can observe uh, a bandwidth of influence of uh, several hundreds of megahertz. So this has a strong impact, potential impact with uh, coexistence. So imagine you have two operators, operator one and operator two with, two with different spectrum, and the bandwidth of influence of operator two, operator two is huge. What happens is it will add a propagation path to uh, the channel of between operator one and its uh, customer, which is not a problem if you look uh, at it like, uh, in the, uh, I mean, it becomes a problem when this propagation path is fluctuating over time very fast, so fast. And so unexpectedly that the operator one is no longer able to adapt the transmission to the propagation channel. Power control, link adaptation, adaptive beamforming, everything is not working any longer. So this is uh, what we call that, what is known as a channel state information mismatch. 
So we are investing in that uh, now with uh, network manufacturers experimentally with true, true base stations, uh, risk prototype, etc., to check whether this problem is really serious, because we've seen that the risk is high, limited area of influence. So maybe it's not so, so serious. Last thing I like to show and recall it's uh, this joint work by uh, NEC, Orange, and CCF. It's not simple to deploy a risk. It's not simple to know where to put it. So you have to use advanced uh, tricks like uh, ray tracing tools and optimization schemes to know where to place it. So we, I, I, I'm running completely out of time. So I'm five minutes less, left uh, late. So what I want you to uh, uh, remember. So uh, RIS seems uh, after three years of research, we think that RIS is promising for millimeter wave, but we have a business driver issue. Millimeter wave is not deployed yet. It's not deployed yet because we have not found yet a driver for that. We are already struggling to make value, to make value of sub six gigahertz 5G. Okay. So there is a big question mark. Is millimeter wave going to uh, meet uh, market need in Europe. Uh, it's not yet fully mature. I have shown some open questions. It's very advanced, very advanced, but not fully mature. Regarding the two use cases uh, on our own side, we see it more as a booster, a passive relay, and also uh, as a way to um, meet requirements, I mean, needs of the society regarding uh, exposure. And uh, there are two problems we are working on uh, actively now. It's spectrum coexistence. I hope this year this will be solved. And we are discussing with Agence Nationale uh, des Fréquences in France, with uh, several uh, partners who have uh, experience in RFID backscattering techniques, for instance. And uh, we've, uh, we are making tests on, uh, we are studying the problem with experiments. Is, is CSI uh, mismatch really a problem? And uh, AOI and deployment challenges, uh, there is no solution than finding the right simulation methods or theoretical methods to take this into account. And uh, we recommend to, to make more efforts in prototypes, experimentation, and pre-standardization, not yet standardization, it's too early, to uh, answer the questions. And we are also working on variants of risk. Uh, transmit refractory antennas like uh, 10, uh, 10 or more, 20 years ago are coming back. And we also uh, still trying to comply the three pillars, economical, uh, uh, environmental, and uh, societal, to see uh, what if we could reuse all nodes uh, and uh, devices and just add uh, risk capability. It's minimum minimum additional cost, minimum additional carbon footprint, and some potential benefit to check. And we have a prototype. I have not put the reference here, but uh, a prototype was presented uh, last year in UCAP with the Institut Angela. I'm sorry for the eight minutes, <laughs> the additional eight minutes. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I have some a few questions. Uh, um, at the beginning, you have said that Apple have proposed uh, another thing. Could you please repeat that point? Because uh, yeah, uh, I know Apple was from the Etsy IG Risk uh, Group. It's a press standardization group. It's not uh, based on uh, IEEE papers or academic papers. It's really uh, their views in standardization. And uh, what they propose is to control risk from the smartphone, okay, uh, without uh, us being aware or in the loop. So we fought uh, at the ETC group so that uh, at least uh, we are, uh, the network operator is aware. At least there is a request 
from the smartphone to say, okay, can I can I use a RIS with your permission? <laughs> Etc. But uh, yeah, it's we don't like that because um, the RIS has a large boundary of influence. So an Apple smartphone would manipulate a RIS, but it would impact other guys, okay. right? In the area of influence other guys that have nothing to do with this Apple smartphone. So okay. we, we want to keep control of, of things and we think the scheduler has to be aware. This is a minimum, has to be aware of what is doing the risk under the control of a smartphone. Okay, thank you. Uh, you've mentioned uh, three categories, uh, fully con controlled, uh, partially controlled and no control. Uh, and if I have understood, I mean, uh, the only one that we uh, have, uh, you have already um, uh, tested the prototype is the uh, no control one. I mean, uh, the RIS uh, wasn't controlled by the base station or uh, uh, neither fully or partially. My question is, uh, do you think that these three categories will coexist or uh, will you, do you think that only one category would dominate the the Actually, the one we have tested is not in, in here oh. because you don't see any guy engineer tuning the RIS, right? This is automatic. Oh. On the field, there was a guy yeah. with okay. a laser. Uh, so... <laughs> it was manual tuning. Oh, okay. Manual tuning with a bit of optimization software, but there was a guy tuning the RIS. So it's wow. not, the field trial risks are not even in this. Okay. Okay. I want to be clear uh, regarding the maturity of the technology. I believe it will be uh, possible, but in 2024, uh, 2023, I have not uh, tested it myself. Maybe in China, maybe in China, I'm not sure, uh, like uh, what DT does with China Mobile. Maybe they have something really automatic. Okay. So, so that, does that answer your question? A, a, a part of it. I mean, uh, the question was, which one of the, these three uh, categories, will they coexist? Or there is someone uh, that will dominate in the future? What do you think about these uh, three categories? Fully controlled, partially controlled, or... Uh, it will depend on, on uh, the research manufacturers and the network manufacturers. I, I can't, uh, I don't know yet. Okay. And today the most advanced companies in the world on this technology is, uh, I mean, as risk provider, it's Greener Wave, ZTE, NTT Docomo, and, and we see with uh, the autonomous uh, risk. So it's mainly what they will produce. And I think Nokia is working, but I, I don't think they have a prototype yet. Okay, thank you. I mean, last remark, I will let uh, other yeah. people ask questions. Uh, in slide 20, I think there was a typo or something, because yesterday we were talking about 5 watts maximum, and today I've seen 15 or something. So, but yesterday, yeah. 5 watt maximum. Huh? Um, yeah, the, 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 but you didn't have a presentation from Greener Wave, no? Uh, Mr. Fink, he... Uh, Huh? Yeah, it was it wasn't this, but I think. Uh... No, 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 no. This is a true risk from Greener Wave today, but they are working, and Matthias Fink is involved in in this company. I don't know, ah, okay. Okay. but they are working on on the other one, order of magnitude lower. I mean, uh, what or below what? Okay. Uh, so I mean, I a new see... one. So maybe he was either talking about the new one or talking about something else, but this one is, is this is its true uh, power consumption. Okay. Yeah, they have a lot. They okay. have a lot of different prototypes. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. I mean,